All right, I think it's about time uh, to uh, be getting started. So um, uh, I know I know people will be uh, joining in for a little bit, but um, I don't I don't want to uh, let the schedule slip too much. So welcome. Uh, I'm Cliff Lynch, and uh, you've reached the second day of the virtual event that's part of the um, fall 2021 CNI member meeting. Uh, we have a um, great uh, set of um, project briefings and an invited session um, to share with you today. And um, I just want to make a couple of very brief um, uh, comments before we uh, before introducing the first uh, session. So we're doing this um, this uh, virtual event in web meeting rather than uh, the webinar mode that we had been using for prior virtual events. That means that by looking at the participants, you can see who else is uh, uh, part of the meeting, and you can use the chat to talk either to everyone or to specific individuals. If uh, you see people you want to uh, say hello to. So we'll also be using the chat for um, questions that you may have for the uh, speakers. Um, we will try and take Q&A at the end of every presentation. However, um, we are on a pretty tight schedule, and um, I can say from experience yesterday that there were some sessions where we really didn't have time to uh, take um, hardly any um, questions. Um, uh, and certainly not all of them at, in most of the presentations. Uh, if you ask questions in the chat, though, it may be that one of the presenters um, can uh, respond to your question via chat, either, um, either during the presentation or after the presentation. So um, uh, that may be helpful as well. We have a couple of breaks scheduled uh, during the course of the um, of the virtual event today, which will go till a little after five Eastern time. Um, in addition, there are, are going to be pauses of you know three or four minutes, uh, um, order of magnitude, between each session as we just switch over presenters and things like that, and we'll just put up a brief um, uh, you know um, slide saying we'll be right back. So with that, I think we are pretty much set to. Uh, Go ahead, and um, so let me introduce our first session and speakers. So we have a session um, to open the meeting on controlled digital lending. This is an approach to sharing material that really, I would say, came into its own as an essential tool during the pandemic. Um, uh, as a way of making available materials um, uh, to people um, who couldn't get to physical materials in our libraries or when our libraries were physically closed. Uh, the topic specifically today, though, is going to be around um, controlled digital lending uh, in consortial as, a, as well as um, individual library settings. And I think this is a particularly important issue as we very rapidly um, discovered that uh, when physical libraries closed, we had a lot of operational issues with consortia that relied on the ability to do physical reciprocal borrowing uh, between institutions and patrons that were in a common geographic region. So I'm very uh, pleased to be able to welcome uh, Nathan Mealy from uh, Wesleyan University, Michael Rodriguez from the University of Connecticut, and Charlie Barlow, who's the executive director of the Boston uh, Library Consortium, uh, who will help us to um, understand the 
current thinking and the current approaches um, on this uh, more effectively. So welcome, thanks for being with us and over to you. Thank you so much for that great introduction, Clef. I'll go ahead and get us started and uh, Nathan and Charlie will uh, take on later sections of the presentation. So good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on your time zone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the uh, CNI project briefing on collaboratively building the future for controlled digital lending. What we're hoping to do today is to introduce you to CDL so we have a shared understanding of its benefits and what it is, uh, and also share what the Boston Library Consortium or the BLC has done in this space in collaboration with other groups. We'll also talk about what we are doing and what we're aspiring to do and how you can contribute to these larger movement around controlled digital lending. Um, so I'm Michael Rodriguez, as Cliff said. I'm a collection strategist at uh, the University of Connecticut Library. And with Nathan Neely, I co-chaired the BLC's original CDL working group. And we're both continuing to serve on the uh, BLC's CDL steering committee. And, uh, Nathan and Charlie, if, if you just want to hop in and say hello to the group as well. Hi, everybody. So I'm Nathan Mealy, Associate University Librarian for Discovery and Access at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Um, as Michael mentioned, I was the co-chair of the BLC's CDL Working Group, and I'm currently the co-chair of the BLC's CDL Steering Committee, which is more the implementation phase of controlled digital lending. And I'm Charlie Barlow. I'm the Executive Director of the Boston Library Consortium. Great to have, be with you all today. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie and Nathan. Um, so just to level set with uh, the group on what controlled digital lending is and what its benefits are, CDL is essentially the digital equivalent of print library lending, where a library can take a digital scan of a print book or other item that it owns and lend that digital scan in lieu of the print to patrons under controlled conditions. And we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics on the next slide. But to really hone in on the advantages of controlled digital lending at any scale, um, CDL has the ability to support patrons who are quarantined, who are traveling, who may be studying remotely or online, studying abroad or on sabbatical, for example. Uh, it can facilitate access to materials for patrons with print disabilities so who would no longer potentially no longer have to request special accommodations to engage with print collections. Uh, and it would support anyone who's unable to access physical materials um, for a wide number of reasons. It can also foster equitable access to library resources in online and hybrid educational environments, as well as situations in which institutions may have multiple campuses that are geographically distant from each other with those uh, physical collections primarily based at a single campus. CDL also reflects that digital delivery of library resources has become the norm, not the exception. Um, and this has been uh, a fact that has been building for many years well before the pandemic, which has certainly accelerated that expectation among our patrons. And finally, controlled digital lending can improve environmental sustainability by reducing the, the economic and environmental costs of shipping material among library locations, uh, as well as preventing loss or damage to print items as a result of shipping or circulation, um, which you can see would be particularly beneficial in the cases of shared print programs, archives and special collections, or any, any situation in which the print items may be too rare or fragile uh, to handle routinely. Uh, CDL really has a transformative effect in this regard in terms of opening up access to that long tail of material that our patrons need but is not available in electronic format, whether through publishers or through the public domain. Some core principles of how CDL as a mechanism operates. Uh, the first principle is that a library must own a physical, uh, a legal copy of a, the physical book acquired by purchase or through a gift. Um, the second is that the library must maintain an own to loaned ratio, simultaneously lending no more copies than it legally owns. 
Um, what this means in practice is that the digital scan can be loaned to only one patron at a time, and that the print book has to be um, removed from circulation and patron access while the digital scan has been loaned. And thirdly, the library must use technical measures, i.e. Uh, digital rights management software, to ensure that the digital copy cannot be copied or redistributed. So in other words, if the, uh, if the digital scan is loaned, that loan expires and the patron loses access after a certain period, and the patron is not able to keep that item indefinitely or to share it with others. Um, there is, uh, these principles were articulated in a white paper on controlled digital lending of library books that was created by uh, Kyle Courtney and David Hansen, and I certainly encourage anyone to read it if they're interested in, in some of the legal frameworks and mechanisms for CDL. I wanted to close this particular section with a quote from Library Futures, which is an advocacy organization that champions the right to equitable access to knowledge. They released a policy document on CDL fairly recently, and that document has a great line that states that through CDL, libraries can amplify what they do best by meeting communities where they are, both physically and digitally. Uh, Cliff touched on this point. Um, during the pandemic, of course, CDL as a um, efforts and engagement around CDL dramatically accelerated. The white paper that laid out the legal foundations for CDL was published in 2018. And some groups like the Internet Archive and its Open Library Program were implement, had implemented a version of CDL for a number of years. But you really saw interest and engagement among libraries accelerating uh, in 2020 when the pandemic shut down physical access to so many collections. We saw a wide range of CDL solutions being built to meet local needs, pr primarily electronic course reserves. Um, these solutions were designed um, for local needs. They were not designed to be scalable. And um, in general, they were cobbled together solutions using Box or Google Drive or other um, ad hoc software. We also saw national interest groups uh, emerge and engage with CDL. Um, the CDL Implementers Forum is a great example of this, where um, people from libraries and allied organizations who are interested in CDL came together for informal uh, meetings and information sharing venues to talk about their implementations, their ideas, and their questions. The CDL Co-op also formed, uh, this is the Consortial Approaches to CDL Group, which is sort of an umbrella organization for consortia that are interested in CDL work at scale. We also saw um, higher profile statements by national and international groups. There is a CDL position statement supporting CDL that has um, garnered dozens of signatures from libraries and consortia. And recently, IFLA also released a statement uh, that powerfully makes the case for controlled digital lending on the international stage. Against this backdrop, the Boston Library Consortium convened a CDL working group in September 2020. The group was charged with investigating delivery mechanisms, technology, workflows, policies, copyright and legal issues, shared storage solutions, and other actions related to a potential consortial implementation of CDL among interested BLC member libraries. Uh, the working group consisted of 14 staff from 11 member libraries out of the 20 libraries in the BLC, along with Charlie Barlow as the BLC's executive director. We focused on three major areas. The first was researching the national and global CDL landscape and really engaging in the field, embedding ourselves in these organizations and ad hoc groups that emerged in, uh, during that period. Um, and also making sure that we had um, opportunities to gain and share knowledge in this space. Secondly, we engaged extensively across the BLC community. We had multiple forums and listening sessions with BLC communities of interest and committees whose work pertained to CDL in some way. For example, our resource sharing, access services, technology, special collections, collection management, and other groups within the BLC. Uh, we also engaged directly with the BLC board of directors as well. 
And finally, we consulted with a range of external organizations. And I, I can't tell you how many meetings Nathan and Charlie and I and other members of the working group had with um, everyone from um, in the Internet Archive and Digital Public Library of America and uh, major vendors such as Ex Libris and Project Reshare and, and OCLC. Um, but really, um, embedding ourselves in the space and doing advocacy work and learning what the possibilities were for CDL at a consortial level. We published our final report in September in summer of 2021. Uh, the report is called um, Consortial CDL Implementing Controlled Digital Lending as a Mechanism for Interlibrary Loan and it's linked from this slide. The recommendations of the working group were to proceed with consortial CDL as a mechanism for ILL uh, and the board of directors endorsed this direction. Um, throughout the course of all this work, three core observations emerge. The first is that CDL is for ILL as a mechanism for ILL is an extension of existing resource sharing practices. It fits naturally into those workflows and frameworks. The second is that the commercial technology market is failing libraries desire to implement CDL for a number of reasons that um, my colleague Nathan will get into shortly. And finally, the solution to this is a consortial approach that will enable us to scale impact and investment. I'll hand things over to uh, Nathan to discuss these points in greater depth. Super, thank you, Michael. Um, so, Right, so the first observation there that about CDL extending resource sharing practice was a really a pivotal one for the group's work because it really helped us focus our, 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 our thinking and our energies um, on where to take CDL, both for the BLC and, and for the library world in general. But in, in this case in particular, we saw CDL extending existing practice in two ways. In a legal sense where um, CDL, really ex extends under the same umbrella uh, protections that are afforded to interlibrary loan. Um, and so it's a practice that is, we felt comfortably fell within um, um, existing legal practices libraries have been engaged in for a long time, but also in a services sense, um, we have existing resource sharing systems and existing practices that readily adapt to, to providing um, materials via CDL. And, and overall, what we really felt strongly about was that CDL is not so much a new service for libraries, but is, um, an ex it is really an extension of services that we're already providing. Um, we have a long history of digitizing materials and then lending them both to our patrons and to patrons at other libraries. And we felt like that it was important to recognize this fact that seeing CDL as not a brand new service that we had to think of, think of it and, and, and develop from the ground up, but that we already have a lot of the knowledge, a lot of the um, practices, uh, a lot of the experience, and, and largely have the systems that will enable us to do this now. And, and so the learning curve is not as steep as, as initially my, you, you know, libraries were, 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 were seeing it as. Um, and so this was a really important conceptual element for our group. Um, and ultimately the takeaway from this is really emphasizing the fact that we don't wanna reinvent the wheel um, when moving forward with CDL. We wanna take advantage of existing knowledge and practices that we have now, but from that experience with resource sharing, um, uh, really drawing on that to inform how we move forward with CDL. Um, and I'm particularly avoiding the pitfall of the, the, the cost and the time and energy that would be sunk into um, the work if we really saw CDL as something that we had to start from scratch. Um, you know, one other aspect I think is important to note is that we also don't want to replace existing successful services with CDL. You know, CDL is very powerful, but it does come with these usage constraints um, that will that, that are important to, to be aware of. And we have some services, particularly digitization services related to patrons with, with disabilities that don't that we can offer without the same constraints. And so we don't want to 
substitute CDL for these services that offer patrons more flexibility where it's appropriate. Um, so ultimately, following on from this, uh, the BLC ended up focusing attention on implementing CDL as an extension of the resource sharing practices. Our, this, our consortium had been involved in for a long time and had, had, had been very successful with. Next slide, please. Um, but then what's really, what was really quite fascinating is as we started to look at the existing systems we had for resource sharing and talking to the vendors of the, the, who, who created and maintained those systems, it really became apparent that there was a significant disconnect between what libraries were aiming to accomplish and where the vendors were at in the technology market in general in being able to meet that vision. Um, so we, we, our ideas are really sort of crystallized in this article that we published on the Scholarly Kitchen back in September, uh, where we explored the state of the technology market and, and in particular its, its impacts on CDL. Um, and a core aspect of our, of our concern was the risks posed to CDL by the level of tech, uh, consolidation in the technology market. Um, what we've seen is with CDL in particular, well, the technology market in general has been suffering from consolidation for a long time and to the point where increasingly there are fewer options for libraries to choose from when implementing service X, Y, or Z. Um, and we have many cases where there might only be one viable solution for a library. And when it came to uh, CDL, that meant that we were, the, the libraries were, who all of a sudden in 2020 desperately wanted to implement CDL, we were looking at a very small number of vendors who were, who were capable of providing that sort of service. And um, we we're really relying on them in, in a way that they, may, they weren't prepared to come through on, in, you know, in all honesty. Um, and that lack of substantial response has really kind of continued even to today. You know, we've seen that OCLC, who is the core uh, uh, vendor for resource sharing, has been pretty quiet up until right now. Um, and Ex Libris, the other significant vendor, has taken a path that hasn't really meshed particularly well with the vision the BLC has for, for CDL. And so, in response to this, the BLC looked for a, a path forward that could, could return more power and more flexibility to the hands of libraries um, and to look for ways to leverage the scale, as Michael said, to leverage the scale of consortia to both influence the shape of the technology market, but to also develop this particular solution in a way that would be sustainable for, for libraries and, and, and meet our needs in a way that we could have more say in uh, for, the, for the long term. And overall, SOC consortia is a really key element of that. And project reshare that I'll talk about a little bit later. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so, you know, so con this consortial aspect was very important for the BLC. Obviously, on, on one level, um, this was a consortial effort to explore CDL. Um, and the BLC's resource sharing infrastructure has been a key aspect of the consortium for a long time. Um, and so we started from that level, but we also came firmly to believe that the scale that consortia operate is a really key element in moving this initiative forward. Um, consortia offer scale at so many different levels. They offer scale for funding, uh, scale for collections, um, scale in terms of negotiating with vendors. We have more leverage as a consortia in, in, in practically every case than we do as individual libraries. Um, scale in terms of resources, staff resources, right? Um, uh, and existing knowledge bases. And so that scale is really super critical for an initiative like CDL that really needs libraries to come together and not just turn to vendors and rely on vendors for giving us a solution that, that they think is most appropriate. Um, and this, the, the, the scale piece is also quite critical in terms of supporting a, an initiative like Product Research or any really sort of open source initiative where, well, let's say fledgling initiative, where building up the installed base of that, of that system 
of that solution is really critical. Um, and consortia can bring in, when a consortia joins a new, a new initiative, they can bring in X number of members, 20 members, 40 members, depending on the consortium, uh, as opposed to the user base needing to grow by one library at a time. Um, and, and we felt like that was, that was very important here. Um, in addition, the consortial level of layer of resource sharing is really important. You know, the, the basic model for resource sharing these days is you see if you can fulfill locally, then you turn to your consortia next, and then to the world after that. And so ensuring that that consortial piece is functioning fluidly to, to leverage the collective collection um, is, is a really important aspect of this. Um, and then lastly, consortia are ostensibly microcosms of the larger micro, uh, um, uh, library world, where if we can develop a solution that meets the needs of consortia, uh, we believe it's, 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 it's a logical leap to move from there to, to extend the solution out to the, to the library world in general. And then interoperability became a real, a real um, consistent theme for us when we were talking with vendors. Um, the resource sharing uh, infrastructure uh, that we have today is built on interoperability, right? We've always been able to choose what, what um, uh, resource sharing tool we're using, whether it's Iliad or, or Clio or whatever system your library may use. Um, we've been able to participate in OCLC with, with any of those um, uh, staff facing tools. We've been able to also use Rapid, right? And Rapid and OCLC essentially work side by side. And so interoperability has been a core aspect of resource sharing. And we wanted, it was very important to us in get, when engaging with vendors to emphasize that that can't change. Um, and um, now we have standards in place. We have an ISO standard for, re, for uh, resource sharing. We have a, uh, there's a working group in NISO that's working on a CDL related standard. And so these standards are there for vendors to take advantage of. And you know, obviously it's super important for us that they do so. And obviously interoperability gives libraries choice. We don't wanna see a future for CDL where, you, where you're boxed in, that if you wanna do CDL, you have to do it with this vendor. Or if you wanna do it in a certain way, it has to be with this vendor. We wanna ensure that CDL is essentially like an open playing field um, where libraries can choose the path that best suits them. Um, and then lastly, uh, interoperability ensures that we're able to continue to use the knowledge that we have when implementing CDL. Uh, you, if you don't have to switch the, system, the tool that you're using, that means you can continue to take advantage of everything you know about that tool already to influence how you implement CDL as opposed to if you have to implement a whole different tool just to support that one service and all your previous experience is, is not as relevant anymore. And all this ended up leading us to um, our engagement with Project ReShare. Uh, ReShare began um, its work in 2018 uh, as an effort to build a community-led um, resource sharing software. Um, it's, uh, it, it's based on interoperability. And so all the standards that are out there for inter interoperability reshare supports, it's um, both the, it's community governed and the development of the software is, is, is led by that um, library governance structure. Um, so far they've implemented uh, the returnables module of the platform and they have a roadmap in place for non-returnables uh, and CDL as well as shared inventory. They've worked with a number of consortia um, as well as individual libraries. If you look at their member list, it's pretty extensive and includes both. Um, but for the BLC, what was most important was that community governance, that library led aspect, um, the consortial resource sharing, which um, there's a model in place with Rapid that is, you know, it, it's, its future is a little bit unclear and, um, and which is for the BLC and we believe for consortia in general is very important. Um, it's open source, it's, it's com they're committed to transparency. Um, and that, that involves working with other vendors. They work readily with every other vendor in the space. Um, and they really are focused on collective collections um, and leveraging those uh, for consortia. And so there was real alignment between the BLC and ReShare on our visions for CDL. 
And um, so really early on, a natural partnership began to form to the point where at this point, the BLC is, is, is working to become a member of Project Reshare and making uh, both staff and financial commitments to staff time and, and financial commitments to, to help further the CDL work in a way that, that aligns with the BLC's vision. And that we, and that we also, I, you know, it, we believe extends out to the library world as well in a, in a model that everybody would benefit from. Thanks, Nathan. So regarding the BLC's continuing efforts in this space, um, we talked a lot about the work of the working group. Um, we also, uh, when the uh, recommendations of the working group were accepted in August and September of 2021, part of that recommendation was to convene a CDL steering committee for the BLC that would help guide this implementation work. The steering committee uh, is meeting now, and it's focusing on, on several significant areas that I'll briefly talk about. The first is really seeking ways to leverage consortial scale in our efforts. So looking at ways, for example, to facilitate um, digitization at a central level or shared storage of those digital files uh, so that each individual library will not have to digitize its own copy of a book in order to lend it. We also are engaging with vendors across the board. As Nathan highlighted, we are making a, a sustained commitment and investment in project reshare, but we're also continuing conversations with Ex Libris and with OCLC and other vendors that um, uh, are part of the resource sharing space. Um, OCLC in particular, I think has not been particularly deeply engaged in these CDL conversations in the past, but we've been having some very productive conversations with them recently as CDL increasingly becomes much more of a mainstream consideration across the industry. With regard to Project Reshare, we're continuing to pursue that partnership and, uh, and, and deepening the relationship. The BLC Board of Directors voted to make a $100,000 contribution to Project Reshare to further the development of CDL capacities. And um, Reshare will be, uh, will be running fundraising matches with existing members as well as with potential development partners um, to pool together enough funding to, to build out these capacities in their systems and their uh, technologies. Um, we've also been engaged in, in grant writing to seek support from external foundations uh, to advance the, the, this consortial vision for CDL for ILL. And we've had significant successes in this space that we, we can't quite talk about yet, but um, uh, are, very, are very promising and, and very positive in terms of, of seeing commitments from funders and foundations uh, towards controlled digital lending at scale. We'd like to end this presentation with a call to action for all of you, for all the folks on this call. We encourage you to engage with your consortia about the value of controlled digital lending. Um, we encourage you your, you, your library or your consortia to consider endorsing the CDL Co-op CDL for ILL statement, which lays out the, which lays out the case for CDL as a mechanism for interlibrary loan. We encourage you to gain and share knowledge of CDL and of efforts around it by participating in initiatives like the CDL Implementers Group, the Consortial Approaches to CDL, and other open forums. And finally, we um, encourage unifying vendor advocacy that, so that from all of our different perspectives, we're telling vendors, to, we're delivering to vendors a consistent message around the need for interoperability and for controlled digital lending to be developed as part of existing systems for resource sharing. And when you're ready, we hope that you'll consider uh, contributing to ReShare, um, whether that is staff time or funding or knowledge um, that is all um, very welcome and encouraged in terms of supporting CDL for ILL development. Uh, I think we're now ready for the Q&A period. Um, so I encourage folks to go ahead and start putting your questions into chat. Um, and while you're thinking of questions or typing them out, I'll invite uh, Charlie and Nathan to chime in if there's any point they wanted to raise that we haven't quite touched on yet.
Yeah, the only thing I would say is that um, I, I just to emphasize that the the all the work the BLC has done so far has been with an eye towards how do we facilitate the libraries across the spectrum moving forward with CDL, at the very least CDL for ILL, um, and and that. Um, that's really our end goal here. It's why we that that call to action is really about get get engaged with our product research, get engaged with CDLI, and so on. You know, I think we saw a potential future that was becoming more narrowly defined around CDL and how you would be able to implement it, and we weren't satisfied that with that and want to see that horizon expanded for everybody. I think our presentation may have answered everyone's questions. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks a lot uh, to all of you uh, for a really thought provoking uh, talk. And I see actually Roger has now entered a question into the into the chat. So I'll let you go ahead with that. If you'd like to, I can read it aloud for everyone. Um, Roger notes that one of the things that's particularly notable about these initiatives is the willingness of librarians uh, to make substantial investments, even when I understand there's at least some legal risk. Can you say a little more about the pragmatism and risk tolerance here? I can jump in and, and do my best to answer that, Roger. Um, no, I think that the CDL working group did a really excellent job of analyzing um, the legal risks that were on the table, at least at the time. And I think we've got a lot of work still to do with the steering committee. But I think a lot of the time that we spent in formulating the initial recommendation to implement CDL for interlibrary loan was supporting libraries to engage in it at the level to which they were either most able or most comfortable. Um, uh, so for example, you know, allowing a library to determine which specific components of their collection was to be available or whether they might be borrowing libraries only versus lending uh, and so on and so forth. And we go into that um, to some extent in the final report uh, around sort of the, the nature of sort of the opt-in aspect. Um, when we brought this to the, the BLC board, um, we wanted to be sure that even if an individual library couldn't participate right now today, um, that they felt comfortable and enthusiastic, ideally, uh, about the prospect of supporting uh, their fellow members in the consortium. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, and thank, thank you, Roger, for the question. And it looks like Tara um, Fulton has a comment. I'd also just like to note that individual BLC libraries recognize that their own lawyers will need to weigh in on the level of involvement we can make at the institutional level. But the board nonetheless supported the consortium moving forward as leaders in this arena. Thanks, Tara. Would you like to comment on that? Any of our panelists? Just to say that I appreciate Tara as one of the BLC's board members for, for saying that to, to the audience today. Thanks, Tara. So I don't see any other questions. It's Cliff. So I have a stupid question in another direction. Um, uh, I've just sort of lost track of, of what's going on here. So I've been following work that's been going on um, involving, among others, Lyricis and um, uh, the folks at NYPL who are working on Simply E, 
which is uh, essentially an ebook reader. Um, and I understand that ebooks are a different thing from controlled digital lending. But what I'm wondering is whether you can tell me anything about the interoperability between an app like Simply E as a, as a way to deliver uh, a, a, a piece of content that's being made available under controlled digital lending. Yeah, this is, I think this is perhaps one of the, perhaps this and the legal piece are the biggest challenges with CDL going forward is that, um, the, you know, legal challenges, at least we know the nature of those challenges, but the, the technology piece, we don't know exactly what shape that'll take. And I think interoperability with things such as an ebook reader that would make the ebook so much more, uh, so much more usable um, is, is, totally an open question. Um, so, so what I would say is what we have endeavored to do in, in relation to that challenge is to go back to the interoperability piece I emphasized earlier to really push with a vendor such as ReShare or Ex Libris or OCLC that their tools need to work uh, with other tools such as ebook readers to facilitate the end user experience being as good as possible. And so ensure the standards are there to support that and then that the vendors leverage those standards. But it, there's no question that um, that is, CDL is an actual software that we can use to deliver our services still vaporware. And so we're working, we need to work with these vendors to make sure that the, the solution that they develop provides for that sort of outcome you're describing as well as, you know, we need the tools to, to be, um, um, fluid on the staff end, right? So, because there's a lot of staff concerns around the volume of work associated with CDL. So, how do we make that as sustainable as possible? Um, so, I think in, my, in many ways, I feel like it comes back to interoperability and and with ensuring the vendors engage with the solution on that level. To add to that, Nathan, um, I know that the folks at Columbia University and, and other places that have been vo involved heavily in Simply E app development have been participating in these CDL conversations at the Implementers Forum and elsewhere, as well as on the NISO uh, working group that is formed to develop recommended practices for CDL. So I think um, to, to Nathan's point around interoperability, I think that um, that's at the forefront of a lot of these folks' minds as we as we build toward shared standards for uh, for CDL. So I assume that you are connect your work is connected into the um, the new NISO working group as well. You're you're part of that conversation. Both Michael and I are uh, members of that working group. Yep, Cliff. Great. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. And Kyle, that is a, a wonderful question um, regarding the, the connections between the lending and ownership of licensed ebooks versus controlled digital lending and, and the print copies. Um, I'm actually going straight from the CNI presentation to a talk at the Amigos Library Conference about efforts to license and lend whole ebooks that we acquire from publishers. So I think there are some really exciting opportunities to explore these two areas in parallel and maximize the shareability of books in electronic format, um, whether those are coming from vendors and publishers or whether those are digital scans from our print collections. But yes, as Charlie says, it's that, that we could definitely hold an entire conference on that theme. That's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for chiming in. And um, I see Nettie Lagasse has also weighed in with some comments about the NISO group. So um, that's wonderful. Please keep your comments and questions coming in the chat. and. Um, I'm sure as our presenters get a chance to field those, they'll be happy to do so. 
Um, and I see that we're right at about time. So I'm going to um, transition us to a very brief break now with a final thanks to our three wonderful panelists for bringing this great topic to the meeting and uh, all of our attendees and participants. Thank you so much. We're gonna take about five minutes here to transition to our next speaker who will be Jefferson Bailey of the Internet Archive for what I think will be a fascinating conversation on the Internet Archive Scholar. So with that, stretch your legs, take a break, and we'll see you back in five. Thanks, everyone. And thank you. Thank you again for that great um, presentation. Um, this, is, this is really very, very helpful. And um, I'm really glad we had some of this conversation about how these various efforts are converging and coming together. We certainly are going to want to have folks keep us posted on um, what's coming out of that NISO working group going forward. So thank you again, folks. <laughs>